Amazing. So welcome to the party, everybody. So this is the Ask Me Anything related to creative strategy. And we're super, super excited to be here today with you all. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing both Sarah and Lauren for a little bit of time now. And they're two individuals that I, I respect immensely when it comes to creative strategy. Both of them have such vast different, in back, uh, different backgrounds in terms of where they come from. And all of that starts to shape their experience as it relates to creative strategy. And to me, that's one of the coolest things when it all starts coming together and everyone can kind of be involved to produce the best output. Um, but where I first wanted to kick off this entire, uh, entire session is, is just on our end, um, I'd really just love to start with an icebreaker. So keep things nice and casual more than anything. So what that means here is I've been telling anyone and everybody who's spoken to me is that we're coming up near the end of August and I feel like I've snapped my fingers and all of a sudden we're at the end of the summer, um, which I feel like a time traveler, but always isn't exciting. So I'm wondering, Sarah and Lauren, on your ends, do you have anything fun planned for the rest of the summer? Lauren, maybe let's kick off with you. <laughs> Um, for me, summer is over because my daughter went back to school two weeks ago. Oh, so like, question, we're I'm done. Sorry. We're like <laughs> in it, it's time. So yeah, we're basically back to school. And so, yeah, uh, no more summer plans for me, unfortunately. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. I'm sorry. Sarah, how about yourself? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> school is actually kind of a vacation. If you're a parent, you're like, okay, school. True. Oh, yeah. God, here we go. <laughs> Um, we don't have any plans specifically with our kids, but my husband and I are going to go to Disney World. And I'm like, I'm so excited. <laughs> I don't know what like 32 year old gets excited for 32. I'm 33. Jeez, I don't even know how old I am. Um, 33 year old gets excited about Disney World. But you know, I just, I don't think I've ever been without my kids and mm. I love them, but like they only want specific rides. <laughs> and I kind of don't want to do the same ride like 50 times in a row. So I'm stoked. I still haven't planned that yet, but it's coming. That's so Probably much fun. Nice That's so much fun. Is that going to be a, a California trip or we're we going to, to Orlando? I kind of want to go to California so I can go see Lauren. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to get this. her to come to California because then if she comes to California, I have a pass. So I'm like, let's go. Uh, <laughs> that be so fun. We should okay. That means, that means I have to come then. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. We have to make it's it happen. California trip. <laughs> DTC, DTC. I'm down. Let's do it. After this call, we're going to schedule it. Perfect. Perfect. Let's make it happen. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, you two. Really, really appreciate it. And where I'd like to kick this off first is like, ultimately, like I said, I respect these two immensely. And what that means is like, we really have the privilege of partnering with them here at Motion. So on the Motion side of things, I'm not sure if everybody has heard of us, but we like to think of ourselves as the creative strategist hub. And what that means is ultimately what we're looking to do between so many different teams, we wanna create a common vocabulary that allows us to produce the best creative possible. So with that focus in mind, we've been super lucky to partner with some great brands, some great agencies along the way, and everyone in between, like those you see here, as well as Sarah and Lauren, who have, again, through this, through this motion experience, I've had the pleasure of meeting. Before we dive into everything related to the AMA though, I just wanted to co cover a couple housekeeping things. So like you've seen in the chat, Miguel has thrown in a Slido link. So the Slido link is gonna, where, is gonna be where we handle all of our q and I know there's a function within Zoom that allows you to do it, but let's keep it all there. And the great thing about Slido that you all would have noticed here is it has an upvote feature. So if there's anything you really like to see and you want it to be answered, smash that upvote. That's what's gonna get us there and that's what's gonna allow us to answer. Awesome. And then the final note for everybody, as everyone can see and has heard the lovely lady at the beginning, is that this session is being recorded. All three of us are going to have access to it. We are all going to share it with our respective networks. So don't even worry about if you want to share this with a colleague, someone else in your life, whoever it might be, we've got you covered. <laughs> Amazing. So that now brings us to our AMA. Um, how this really came to be to give everybody context is that Sarah and Lauren have been partnering for a little while and talking a lot about creative strategy. And like I've mentioned a bunch already, we've had the pleasure of just kind of like hearing their thoughts and we really wanna help bring this to life. So they've been driving this entire story of how this looks like and it's really all them and I look to them as the thought leaders. So where I think is a really good place to start is just let these people know who you are and the great experience that you do bring. So Sarah, talk to the people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Evan. So I actually come from a media buying background. I started as a media buyer for about two, three years ago. And originally I was doing lead gen for quite a few years. And then 
I just recently transferred over in recently. I mean, it's been like a year and a half, two years, um, transferred over into e-com space. That happened right before iOS 14. So I got to watch the entire wave of UGC come up. I got to be a part of that whole ecosystem. And now I'm primarily doing creative strategy and consumer behavior research for my business. So my background though, my roots, everything I love is just deep seated in media buying. I'm like obsessed with the <laughs> entire industry. So it's been really fun to kind of see it morph and change and, and be a part of where it's going next. Love it. Thanks, Sarah. And Lori. Yeah, so I come from the creative side. So I've actually been a designer in the e-commerce space for 15 years. Um, I actually started doing uh, landing pages and web development. So that's actually where I kind of got my initial start. And then I really transitioned over into obviously social, paid social, and really just, you know, diving into the creative side of of paid social. <laughs> so uh, that's, I mean, really my business stems mostly from creative um, and making sure that obviously your guys' ads are working in a creative strategic way. Love it. Love it. And I think like ultimately with these two, the biggest thing for me is, is those backgrounds, right? Because having a media buyer background and like that right brain that we're all familiar with, you have to bend into the left side. And it's like, well, how do I start playing in that middle? And then Lauren on her side, being from the left brain perspective, how do we start to build those chops to really learn about the media buying and the data side? So these two together is just like the perfect com combination to just get to the creative strategy piece. And of course, we want to get to your questions, but where I want to start first and foremost is just by setting the stage for everybody so we all know why we're here. So the main thing that I wanted to ask you both first was just like, what is creative strategy and why is it such a hot button topic right now? And then Sarah, maybe you can kick us off with this one. Yeah, so it's really interesting when we talk about creative strategy because a lot of people, I think, get a little bit confused about what the difference is between a media buyer and a creative strategist. And I know we're gonna answer that question too as we get into it, but creative strategy in general, we have two different spots that we're sitting. One, we are kind of the go-between between creative and data. So we have the media buying and the actual paid advertising background, but we also are pretty creative people. We're kind of, I think I've used this term before if you've seen any of my posts, but we're kind of Dalmatian-like. <laughs> We can do both. We can do media buying and we can do the creative side, which includes production, graphic design, copywriting, any sort of like messaging on the creative side and the media buying itself. So creative strategy in particular is a little bit more on the production level. It's very operational. But the other piece of it is is highly communicative. It's all about language and translation. So as a creative strategist, it's my job to make sure that the creative teams that I'm working with understand where we're going. And I think that's kind of where the core of a creative strategist should lie is being able to translate where do we want to get to, to everybody on the team. Because oftentimes I've noticed that uh, brands in particular will separate people, our copywriter and our graphic designer over here, media buyer and the actual like paid advertising team over here. And we're going to keep them separate. My job is to bring them together and translate so that we all understand what the goals are and where we're headed. Love that. Love that. And then Lauren, on your end, is there any other context that you wanted to add onto that one? No, I mean, Sarah pretty much nailed it. I think it's just making sure that, you know, I think on the creative side, if you are the strategist, you need to understand how to talk to the media buyer and actually talk to the creative as well. I think that's kind of the, the big part with a creative strategist is that you have to understand how to talk the creative language. I think some some people just don't know how to talk to creatives and they're actually, there is a certain way of how you actually phrase things in order for them to understand what you want to get in, to make sure that they execute it correctly. But everything that Sarah said is exactly what it is. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then knowing that this creative strategist role lives between these two worlds, I guess, Lauren, um, what is the difference? Like Sarah alluded to earlier, what is the difference between a creative strategist and a media buyer? So again, I think, you know, the creative strategist has to be that bridge between both media buyer and, uh, and design. So the media buyer is obviously more focused on the data, the analytics, like what's actually going on in the ad account, how you're actually going to set up the ads in the ad account, whereas the designer is the one who's actually executing on the ads, creating the ads. But that strategist, that creative strategist has to understand how to take the data from the media buyer and then take that information and translate it to the designer so that they understand what exactly they need to execute on, 
how to make iterations, how to make the copy, you know, correct, how to like update things. So I think it's just making sure that that person in the middle is understanding data, but they're also understanding design, but then they're also understanding trends and like mm. everything that has to go along with it. So really like they're that person that should be, you know, your trend, your researcher, you know, communicating the different, you know, data plus creative. They just need to be that go-between that is, is both data and creative. Love it. Love it. And I did see, as I move over to Slido, everybody, I did see a question that comes in, came in that actually really applies to this. I think I saw it from Jeff. And one of the things we saw is how do you know if somebody is a creative strategist? And then Sarah, maybe you can take that one. Yeah, this it's really funny because this one comes up a lot. <laughs> if I get any questions, it's always like, well, how do you know if someone you're hiring is a creative strategist and not just like they put it on their LinkedIn profile and now they are because that's what their LinkedIn profile says. Um, this is a very difficult question to answer unless you start seeing them in action. So one of the best ways to identify a creative strategist is basically just to see how they work between teams. So this industry is super small. <laughs> There's, there's very few of us in this room right now, but it's going to get bigger. And this is one of the things that I really want to drive home for you guys is if you are currently a media buyer or if you're currently a creative person in just a creative style role, you can become a creative strategist by learning the opposite side. So you don't mm -hmm. have to get stuck into one role of just being, I'm a, I'm a media buyer. How do I become a creative strategist? you already are halfway a creative strategist. <laughs> you already know the majority of what you need to know. You just have one piece that needs to be learned. And I, I, I'm the type of person that thinks that everything can be learned. I don't think that it's left brain, right brain. You're only analytical or you're only creative. I think you just need to turn on that muscle and learn more about it and understand the processes of how it works. To Lauren's point, creative strategists really have to know a lot. <laughs> We, we really have to know a lot of information and we have to have a lot of experience as well of creative strategy, graphic design, creative production, videography, copywriting, media buying. Like you have to understand the basics of brand operations. So there, it is a very large role, but it's one that I think is going to be easier if you start with that basic of something and learn what you don't know. So to identify somebody in this role, the best place you can be is working alongside them. If you notice somebody, especially in your organization, who is really good at media buying, but they're also fantastic at like driving creative strategy itself, like giving you creative ideas. We should test this ad, we should do this angle, we should test this medium. They might be a really good candidate for this particular role. If you are trying to hire someone off of LinkedIn and you're trying to decipher whether they have this experience, the best place to go then is to anybody they're currently working with and ask what's their systems. A good creative strategist always has some sort of system for how they're building strategy. And it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be like crazy amounts of different programs and apps and all kinds of things. But I need to see they have at least a little bit of a system for how they're coming up with their ideas. Hopefully that mm. kind of answers. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. And like Sarah had mentioned right at the beginning of that question, like this is a big question, right? So Lauren, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, so I think, again, I echo everything that Sarah says. Um, I do think it is something that you have, you, like to Sarah's point, you have to know what they're doing. And so, I mean, truthfully, I have seen a lot of people on LinkedIn currently that have switched their, you know, title over to creative strategist. But at the same time, it's like, okay, but I think honestly ask someone to, what do you think creative strategy is? And I think if they can give you an answer of, you know, kind of what we're talking about being both the middleman for, you know, right and left side, I think that's a good indicator of like, okay, well, they are at least thinking that way is that they have to know data. They have to know creative. They have to understand it. Um, and just really like, yeah, just really shadowing kind of what they're doing and how they're, they're talking to people. I mean, it's, it's funny, like, obviously, like I come from a creative background and again, to Sarah's point, like I, you know, I don't really, <laughs> don't really use the data muscle too much, but I was so fascinated with it that like, I had to understand how to do it. And I had to learn media buying in order to like understand, okay, if I'm going to make my ads and my creative more effective, I actually need to understand how they're working, how they're being placed in ad accounts, how I'm talking to consumers. And I think that's just something that if a creative strategist can understand that, then I think that you have like a, you know, a really solid creative person that could be in a creative strategist role. Mm, and I really want to like 
um, use that in springboard off what you were mentioning there. Because something that I, I love that Sarah had mentioned a little bit earlier is really like from a, um, a newness perspective for lack of better terminology, like this is such a new category in terms of like, who does this? What is it? How do we get it done? And everything in between. So Lauren, based on that background of yours, like which really started on the creative side, do you think that brands, agencies, and everyone in between need like a dedicated creative strategist right now? Or can certain like individuals wear that hat in the short term? That's a loaded question. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think honestly, I think you need to have a dedicated creative strategist role. I think it's just too big of a, like, a role and a position to fill to have someone do it. I mean, if you want it done right, you need to have someone dedicated to it. There's so much that goes beyond just, you know, being that go between. They need to understand the research. They need to understand how to do audits. They need to understand how to pivot quickly. Like there's a lot that goes into creative strategy. And so I think if you have someone on your team that, that, you know, can just kind of fill that role, like then you're not going to have a good creative strategist. You're not going to execute mm. the way that you need to. So I definitely don't think that you should just give it to someone and be like, okay, you can do it now. Like you need to have a designated role for sure. Love it. We need the poetry snaps. We need the poetry snaps. Like emojis. I wish those, I wish those existed. I wish those existed, but this is honestly like the perfect jump off point to actually take it to the Q and A that we've gotten from the, from the community here. So as I look, everybody can see my screen where we're looking at the ranks or not even ranks, just the upvotes that people have gotten and Haley or Hale, apologies for the um, mispronunciation if I messed up here, but basically this is the perfect question to help us jump off. This will filter into everything else we see. So Sarah, if you could kick us off, what should be the, uh, what should the creative strategy process look like? And there's some examples here, but talk to us about yours. Yes. So the creative strategy process I've noticed is very different depending on the person who's actually in this particular role, which is not at all a bad thing. I think you definitely want to have a different process because it's got to be specific to the brand, whatever brand that you're working with. So my process is the system is the same, but the actual outputs are very different depending on the brands I'm working with. So I start from a research standpoint, and I think Lauren does as well. We have kind of a different path that we take on both of them. Mine is much more consumer behavior psychology. So I wanna find out exactly who these people are as a human on a daily basis, what's their lifestyle? Not necessarily how old are they? How much money do they make? Do they have kids? Like, do they have cats? That demographic information is semi-useful, but it doesn't really tell me what motivates them to buy. So I usually start with common aggregation and analysis. So what, we're, what I'm doing is called NLP. Uh, natural language processing. So I go through and pull a whole bunch of comments out and I'll usually take somewhere between 500 and a thousand different comments. Um, I used to do it all by hand. So that was not a smart way to do it. Um, now I have an actual AI system that does it for me. Thanks to my brother, cause he's a data analyst and works for my fitness pal. So he was very nice and built it for me. <clears throat> anyway, so now I have this, this system that I just run all these comments through but I'm looking for a couple different markers, lifestyle events, anything that just happened this year. Did they just quit smoking? Did they just sell their house? Did they give up on their outdoor garden? Like what happened this year for them? Uh, and what did that create? What kind of a need did that create? Then we're looking for emotional motivators. So anything that pertains to kind of like, what's driving that emotion from them? Is it you know frustration, depression? Is it exciting? Is it elation? Is it happiness? What's driving the purchase itself? And then I'm looking for anybody that's influencing them. Are they shopping with their mom or their dad? other kids, their coworkers, who you shop with will change how much you buy, what you buy, what colors you buy, where you buy it. it. I mean, like the consumer research is super, super important for the rest of the strategy. So once I take that, then I'll create an actual profile of the consumers themselves, and we can use that to generate the ads. So once I get to profile stage, then I'm using it as a way to translate to the team. So I'll work with the graphic designer, the copywriter, any of our media buyers, any of the actual creative team, and once we go into production, I'll say, OK, this is the character that we're actually forming for the ads themselves. So I don't take it to my UGC creators or anybody from a script standpoint anymore. Mm. Um, I don't usually give anybody like a please say this. Usually I'll give them a character like we are looking to play 
a 35 year old female who loves to garden, but she recently had this particular plant die and she just doesn't know where to go. And she's really frustrated by that. So I'll give that to the team because it's easier for them to kind of personify themselves into a character than it is for them to say the script in a way that sounds natural. So that's kind of the process for my actual structure of how I do the strategy part. What goes into that though, <laughs> is a ton of reading. So I'm on TikTok, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn and Pinterest and Google and Reddit. Like I'm constantly immersing myself in the platform to make sure I'm staying up on trends in particular. This is super crazy important. I have to know what's happening in the culture. I have to get a read on where people are emotionally as like a society, just so I can put it into the ads correctly. Otherwise, you're kind of just guessing as to what's coming up next. Um, anyways, that, I tried to squish it down. There's more into that, but like that's the basis <laughs> of how I do it. I but Lauren, then, Lauren has a good one too. I would love to hear hers because she's got like a totally different path and it's, oh, they're both, they're both so good. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I mean, honestly, ever since talking with Sarah, so obviously I come from, again, from the design side. So really for me, like my biggest like look in is obviously the creative side. So I do creative audits first. So I actually look at the website, the landing pages, the emails, um, what actual contents I have to work with. And really I dive into what are people actually saying on the website? What are the reviews people are leaving? Good, bad, moderate. Like I try to find everything that's actually going into what the customer is actually saying on their social, like everything. I literally do a deep dive of everything creative, but then also review. And then within that, I also do trend research. I mean, literally Sarah and I use the same thing for trend analysis and like finding Love little it. nuggets that we can have. Um, and then I kind of take all of that information and then that's where I kind of start to put together my persona. So Sarah is definitely like consumer behavior side first, where I'm actually obviously creative side first. And so I have actually taken a lot of what Sarah and I have discussed like in the past and have really honed in on more of the emotional side of things, more of like the stage of life side of things, as opposed to you know, I think a lot of times like brands will have this generic customer persona, but really like diving into like where they are in their stage of life, what emotional triggers do they have? It really does affect so much of how you actually buy that it's really kind of translated the way that I start to build out customer personas mm -hmm. as I'm looking at the creative and the reviews itself. Love it. Love it. And I, and I love it because like when we look at, when you look at Hale or Haley's question here, like we're talking about how do we even think about where to start. So even before ideation, how do we just get caught up to speed on what's been going on? So that first check, bar, check box there, then we move to the ideation of what's actually do with the personas like you've chatted about. And then it ultimately moves into some of the, like the briefing elements of interacting with different team members and such. Talk to us and help round us out on the, um, like once something goes live, what happens next? And then Sarah, jump back into your process for us. Yeah, so the iteration process is really interesting because, it, again, it kind of depends on where the brand is going. And I saw in the chat, someone actually brought this story up. Um, I worked with a brand that did Hoppy Teas, and we did the entire research process for them and found that their particular audience really leaned towards the fact that they felt a little ostracized from the alcohol crowd because they couldn't drink alcohol anymore. So because we found this, like, very sensitive point for this particular customer crowd we built ads off of that um, and in particular one of the actual phrases that we used was you can have your hops and drink it too right you can still drink with the alcohol crowd you just don't have to consume the alcohol right because anybody that's given up alcohol and still drinks with their friends like still goes out with their friends knows that it's very touchy sometimes when everyone has a drink in their hand and you don't <laughs> it's just it's a very sensitive thing i'm not sure why alcohol is this way it's just a society thing Anyway, so we ran this ad that said, have your hops, drink it too. And it was fantastic because we were able to drop customer acquisition, customer acquisition costs by 40% within the first week. And so from that particular ad, because I knew the emotional set was correct, we knew that it worked. Mm. The next thing I needed to do was find the next five combinations of the iteration. Most people that I've worked with, especially on the media buying side, do iterations based upon kind of a guess. They're not sure what worked in the ad. So they'll take the ad and kind of piece it apart and test all of the pieces separately. 
I don't love to do it that way because I find that it's very difficult to figure out, well, which piece worked. I mean, you split them all up. They work together in this ad, but once you split them up, then it's like just scattering the puzzle pieces and we don't know where they're going. If you know the emotional set first, and this is why both Lauren and I work off of a research first base, like huge research base. If you know the emotions, then you're able to iterate on the emotion, which is way easier to get things in line and to start seeing new results as you go along. Love it. And Lauren, on your end. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same, truthfully. I mean, <laughs> like, it's taking kind of, I mean, it, it really like it's hard because I think a lot of times, even on the creative side, it's always like, well, let's just test this hook or let's just test this. And it's like, okay, well, testing the hook is great. I, you know, I'm all for testing hooks, but if you're testing a hook, but then it doesn't really do anything, it's like, okay, well, I'm only testing that specific hook and it's not really like driving a conversion. It's not really driving a sale. It's like, I just tested the hook. Okay, great. The hook works. So now, like, now do we, where do we go from here? You know? So it's like, what part of that ad worked? Was it the copy? Was it the headline? Was it the hook? Like, I have no idea. So I think just really understanding for the brand specifically, like what exactly we're trying to test and what exactly we're trying to like drive towards is really like the first thing that you need to figure out in the research. So um, making iterations will be a lot easier because once you know your North star, then like, okay, then, you know, that's the point that I need to start testing towards. Yeah. yeah you're, yeah. Uh, you're totally right. I think one of the biggest things that you can take away from this is like, as a creative strategist, it's my job to know why it worked. Most of the time on creative or on media buying side, we don't know why we just know it did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's really important. I think for a creative strategist to have a read on what's working and why super important. Mm, I love that. I love that. And would you say like the immense amount of research that's being done prior as well as after launch is really informing that why? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, and to Lauren's <laughs> point, she goes through everything, all the landing pages, all the emails, both of us do this like big bold work of understanding the brand first. What, do, what is your even ecosystem? What planet did you build? So yeah. we know where to direct <laughs> people to, right? Right. <laughs> like, it's really important. I think for people to understand like we have to have a read on what the heck is going on first. And it's tough because media buyers, that job is big. I mean, yeah. I've been in that role for years and it is a heavy role to figure out when to increase spend, when to turn things off, how to know whether or not we should just leave it for another week. Like there's a lot of uh, what, intuition that goes into media buying. And I don't think we should place the entire creative strategist role on top of the media buyer's shoulders because it's like, whoo, <laughs> that's a heavy yeah. one. Well, and too, like, I think you find holes too. I mean, as you're doing all this research, yeah. you literally, you find the gaps that you're like, oh, well, we did, we, we're not talking about this. We're not even, you know, even bringing this up at all. So like, if you're finding those holes then you're like, boom, that's an ad. That's a way to like get in yeah. someone like that's a way to, you know, trigger someone's emotions. Like you find all those holes first and then, you know, okay, these are the sorts, these are where we start. And this is how we can build off of that. These are creative strategists, folks. This is this is the conversation. This is the conversation we're here for, right? This is the conversation we're here for. Uh, and and uh, the thing that I really liked about that initial question, it gives us that high level insight of like start to finish. What are some of the things? Because now we can actually start to dive in to start some individual elements. So when we're talking about that initial research and we're talking about the initial like ideas that we're trying to come up with, I saw a question in here um, that talked about from Abby, where we see is like, what are the three most important things uh, to know about a brand in order to get a creative, great creative strategy? So maybe Lauren, you can kick us off there. Ooh, three? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I was like, wait, I only get three? Um, I know, that's, that's <laughs> tough. I mean, I think, again, it's one of those <laughs> things, like every brand is different. So like to just name three most important things about a brand is tough because again, you're going to have, you have to research the brand, but I think like the, the biggest thing I think would be to understand is what is the goal? Like where, what are we trying to do? You see, you're trying to get people to purchase, but like, how are you getting them to purchase? Where are you driving these sales? What are they like about your brand? Like, what are they understanding about it in order to like make that connection of how they want to purchase? Like, again, there's like, oh, this is a really hard question. Um, 
I'm like, tra- like all these things are going on in my head that I'm like, okay, three, <laughs> like what can I pinpoint? But it's so like, again, like when, when you sit down and actually do the research and you're trying to understand like, you know, the, the important things that you have to know, it's like, to be honest, like, I feel like it's all important. I mean, everything about that initial research and learning about the brand is like, you have to know everything. You have to understand what are your customer pain points? Like, what are people Mm. actually saying? Um, like really it's just, it's pretty, I feel like it's everything. I don't know, Sarah, that's a, that's a tough one. (laughs) That's a tough one. Yeah. This was a really tough one. Um, I'd say the three most important things you should know about the brand, who are their customers, first of all, which is research-based. We've already kind of touched on that. Uh, what does the brand want to put out in the world? Cause most of the time the brands have an idea of like, this is the message that we want to send to people. Almost always it's some sort of like a, this is the type of brand we want to be. We want to be a cool brand. We want to be a fun brand. We want to be a personality brand. We want to be like a professional brand. But the last thing I would say, and probably most important is you need to know where do they want to go? What are we trying to do this month? So I usually take this month to month, but it's usually, are we trying to scale this month? Are we trying to prep for Black Friday? Are we trying to reduce costs this month? What's happening with the ecosystem of the brand so that I know as a creative strategist what I need to tell the team, basically. So yeah, all of that research, all of the just making sure you understand the brand ecosystem and what they want to send out to the world. And then make sure you understand what are we trying to get to this month? Because without that goal, you can't do a strategy at all. <laughs> mm, yeah. mm. And then this isn't a question that I saw on Slido, but it's something that I think of just to give the, the folks here a little bit more context. So during that research, I almost feel like, and let me know if this is the case, but once you have so much data that you can consume, it can almost lead to like analysis paralysis. And it's like, which way do I go with it? Right? Yeah. So oh when we're God. talking about like, the three most important things about a brand, maybe we think about it a little bit differently. Like maybe the question is just like, and to give people context, it's like how many characters do you end up like with after you've done your research? And then how do you go about prioritizing like where that focus lies? Like let's maybe, let's maybe dive into that. Sarah, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way to rephrase that because that kind of narrows it down a little bit, especially when it comes to paid advertising. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Once you, there's sometimes I'll come up with brands and start to work with them on the research. And they're like, we have like three customer personas. And these are the ones that we're want to go towards. And I'll do the research. And I'm like, actually you have like 30. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I'm a little concerned. This is where kind of the, kind of the USP for my entire business is the fact that if you have 30 different personas, that's a lot. How are you going to align your marketing so that you can hit every single one without like leaving some of them out, right? So I like to come at this from a a personification standpoint and a psychographic. What are the emotional needs that apply to all 30? That's what we're trying to figure out. I don't wanna find out, you know, I don't wanna stick ourselves in like a pigeonhole where we're only marketing to people 25 to 35, only females, only somebody that has this type of car or this type of dog or this type of life. I really want to find out what's the similarities between a 25 year old and a 65 year old. Cause I guarantee you there are similarities. Yeah. (laughs) Everybody struggles with the same things. Consumers are really interesting. They, they have childhoods that shaped them, parenting styles that really influenced how they see the world and then friends that continuously influence them as well. So what happens in your twenties, you may be a different kind of buyer but you may struggle with the same internal insecurities that a 65 year old does. And that makes it way easier for us to craft an entire strategy around what's the emotion that we're trying to hit so that people know we're talking to them. Mm. That's what the creative strategist is supposed to do. And then Lauren, to, to make it a little bit more granular, there's a question that's right here that talks about like how to craft a story once you get a pain point. So this one's very specific, right? So what we've started with is high level, the research, we've moved to the different characters and then how to satisfy the individual needs. Are you ever entering a space, like just whether it's in your mind or even output related that dives into like, hey, I have a product, I have this pain point, let's do this thing. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, every brand has that. I mean, let's be real. Like everyone has like that one product pain point. And so crafting a story around that, honestly, I think those ones are the easiest ones to do because it's not like you already know the pain point, you already know what you need to talk about. You already know that these are the, like, this is the product. Okay. So for instance, I'll give an example. So I have a, I have a client who's a non-alcoholic brand and one of their biggest pain points uh, that we were actually trying to target towards was pregnant women. 
because obviously you can't, as a pregnant woman, a pain point is obviously you can't drink. And so one of the biggest things for us was that, okay, well, you can't drink. So let's target that pain point and let's really hone in on, you can have this because it's not an alcoholic. There's literally no alcohol in it. You could still be social where you need to be social. You don't have, you know. Oh. Make it frozen. so that these pregnant women cannot feel ostracized. Oh, did I freeze? You were frozen for a second, but oh, you're good. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Anyways, it basically like, it was just like, let's not ostracize these women because they can't drink because they're nine months pregnant. And so like mm -hmm. crafting the story around that was actually really easy because it was really just trying to get these women to feel a part of the, a part of the talk and a part of the group by this, by the fact that they can drink this alcohol and not have to feel like they don't, they can't drink because they're pregnant. Like they always have to be the driver. So I think something like this is like crafting the story when you already know the pain point, I think is much easier to develop than when you don't have that, like when you have like such a large story that you need to like talk about, I think it's much easier to do the pain points. Awesome. And what I've done now, everybody, is I know we have our upload system going on and I promise you we'll get to it as we push through. But what I've started noticing is that there are some very relevant questions as they relate to the things that we're chatting about. So something that Connor had written in about is, um, and I think this is while Sarah, you were mentioning just about the different uh, emotions to play into, but can you share an example of marketing to an emotion that is shared by multiple personas? Yes. This is like my bread and butter. I'm so excited to talk about anything with <laughs> consumer psychology. Um, yes. So obviously the one that I shared from the brand that had the hoppy teas, that was like a big, big one for us because they had a persona that ranged from about 25 all the way upwards of like eighties, nineties, because it was literally anybody that had just gone sober recently. And it's not necessarily sober for, you know, health issues. It could be sober just because I don't know, they just decided they didn't want to do that anymore, or they just didn't really like the way alcohol made them feel. But there's several others that I can bring in like to attention. So one of the ones that was really strange for me was um, I work with a company that basically makes a hydroponic stand. And theirs was interesting because they had a huge demographic range. It was like mid twenties, all the way up into your sixties and seventies. Cause it was literally anybody that gardens. <laughs> and that is a huge range of people, especially nowadays because millennials are really into gardening, which is funny. Cause man, I'm an old millennial, like close to gen X. And I don't garden. <laughs> Same. I kill every I plant, know. so I, exactly. I feel you. <laughs> Millennials are so creative. I'm like, you guys are way better than I am. I can't garden. But for this particular subgroup, it was nice because now I can take it and say, wow, we've got a huge market we could sell to. We're not like just limited to this tiny little market. Now we can actually go through and do messaging that hits all of the personas. So for that particular brand, we put together a package that leaned into care for your family by purchasing this farm stand. And it hit extremely well because we said family in particular, right? So we weren't saying care for your spouse or like care for your friends. That's a little too specific. Family could be literally anything. I mean, you can also include friends as your family. So if you were a single person at 25, you might still buy. If you're a 65 year old who lives with just your husband now, you might still buy. So it's nice because we can get wider ranges with this good creative strategy that we have going, so. Yeah, I think to to that point too, Sarah, like when like I come on with a lot of brands and when I get their brand decks and they do have the personas, I'll be honest, I skim through them and I kind of bypass them because I think <laughs> it's just like I I just feel like so many brands come in and they're like, I have to have a persona. I have to have who this person is that yeah. I'm talking to, like Sarah said, you know, like Joe Schmo with a cat who's, you know, in <laughs> Boston. Like and it's so it's hard because I think it's just, it's one of those things like you're narrowing down. So like such a particular person that it's like, you're never going to talk to that particular person. So mm -hmm. you need to open up that range and you really need to understand every emotional side, every life stage, how things intertwine together. Like you can't just pinpoint one thing because really, again, to Sarah's point, you could have 30 people, 30 brand personas within one product. And so I don't necessarily like to name it as that person, but really like they're just a figure that's there. And you can put in any of those things that you want to put into to that particular figure, because at the end of the day, it's like, you're going to talk to a lot of people. And so you really need to understand like who all the people are, not just the one person. 
I love that. I love that so much. And I think like we've covered a ton of the, the research and how we get to a place of what do we want to do. But I think this is a really good place to kind of switch gears and talk about it's time to put pen to paper in terms of briefing. Right. So, Lauren, based on your your background, like you're on you're on the creative side, getting information from people. Now you're in that creative strategist seat. We have a question here on do you have any tips on how to, to brief creators to best uh, well, to produce the best quality possible, certain instructions, certain things to really maximize the output that we're seeing? Yes. So, again, understanding, like, again, taking all that research, all that information and really just quantifying like how do I take all of this and put it into a brief for either your creators or the design team so on our side the biggest thing is that as a creator if you are giving a, a script to a creator like Sarah said don't script it give them just pull, like bullet points of like this is the brand these are the points we want to talk about this is how we need to talk about the brand and as a creator like that's their job to create it like you've hired them for a reason. And so you need to have them like, they're the actors. And so they need to understand what, like how to portray these sorts of traits and qualities in an effective way so that you can actually get the content that you need. And like for me specifically, just working and designing with ads, fleshing out those like creators as well. This is like a totally different topic of like creative strategy, but just know this itself. <laughs> like when you're fleshing out creators, like really do your research on the actual creator. Do they understand how to shoot content? Do they understand how to shoot direct to consumer content? Like it is a, a very different world of how to actually shoot user generated content for a DTC space because they need to understand how to actually sell the product, but sell it in a way that's a storytelling thoughtful way so that people actually resonate with it. So that's just, you know, I'm gonna go off of that subject, but going back to this, like making sure that like your brief is clear on what exactly like the, the points are that you're trying to hit with all the research that you've done and then translating that so that you give the creator their information on what they need to talk about, that they can go shoot the content and then you can get the content back to actually edit the ads. Awesome, awesome. And then Sarah, in your world, um, do you have anything else you'd like to pepper on there? Yeah, so everything that Lauren said, plus, <laughs> Well, she hits it so well every time. I'm like, okay, I have to have something interesting. Um, <laughs> yes. So when you're doing briefs, the only thing I will add is to remember that your creative strategist knows your brand extremely well. Your UGC creators, your graphic designers, your copywriters probably don't know the ecosystem to this level. So the, the important part that I just want to drive home is make sure that you're explaining what the brand is. Like, again, explain the planet. <laughs> you have to explain what's going on so that your creators have a better sense of what they're supposed to be saying. Um, and yes, at this point, everybody needs to just get it out of their heads that you're writing a brief. You are now a script writer for Hollywood. That is your only job is to make sure your actor understands the character that they're supposed to be playing, not necessarily what they're supposed to say, the character that they're supposed to be playing. Because if you give it to them in this sense, they'll be able to place that character on, like just put on that acting role and give you a script that's gonna be way better than anything that you could type out. <laughs> because again, it's really hard for humans to touch things and not leave like an imprint. So the script is gonna sound like you or whoever wrote it. It's not gonna sound like the person who's in front of the camera. So make sure that they understand what is the brand? What exactly do you solve? And then who they're supposed to be playing. Love it, love it. And I think like all of this context to help build those briefs, we started this conversation off with like the, the creative strategist really helping to play a translation layer into what's happening here between the different teams. So one of the things we're also doing as we build our briefs, because I also play in this creative strategy world too, folks, so I feel good about it. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the things one of the things that's also important is just like making data informed decisions and whatever it might be along those ends. And a question that Carolyn here asks is how do you get insights from media buyers and the ad accounts to the creative team or let's think about like content creators in a way that makes sense to them? Um, um, sorry, yeah, let's, kick it, let's kick it to Lauren. Yeah, let's kick it to Lauren. I'm just gonna pause. Yeah, let's kick it to Lauren on that one first. Uh, <laughs> as, like as a creative strategist, I mean, again, like I, I took on, I took on kind of like a media buying role in a sense that like I needed to under I needed to understand the actual ad accounts and the data. So I needed I needed to understand how to actually go into an ad account 
and understand like, what do all, like, what does all this mean? You know, as someone who's a creative looking at all this data, you're just kind of like, wait, what? It, like there's like so much information goes into a Facebook ad account that it's just like, it is a lot, like it's a lot to like understand and a lot to digest. And so thankfully I actually had a really good teacher, Michelle, who was like, I mean, literally she just drove it home to me that like, I needed to understand this, but now I will, I will say motion plug here. That is like, <laughs> the tool. like, I'm not even kidding. Like I, this tool, I wish I had like forever. Yes. Because oh my really gosh. Is, yes. <laughs> it really is an amazing tool to creatively show your designers what is actually going on in the ad account. It's so clear and it's so like the data is aggregated so well that like I can literally send a snapshot to my creators or my creatives and just be like, this is what's working in the account. This is what we need to double down on and give them like some like new ways to pivot. But like truthfully, like motion has been such a game changer for uh, I've been able to do creative like research that like, honestly, like that is literally what I've been using. So <laughs> yeah, yep. It's the a brands that I work with, yes, the brands that I work with that have motion, I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so much harder when they don't come to me with anything at all because I'm like, okay, now I have to translate, which is much harder for anybody that doesn't do media buying because I have to explain what a CPM is, what a CTC yeah. is. Like, I have to explain all these different acronyms, and I'm like, okay, here we go. So yeah, 100%. and it, it, it's true. Like, I mean, and before, like, I used to have like a doc, like a, a Google slide of literally breaking down what exactly, like what we needed to hit, like, what were the CPMs? Like, what was the row yeah. Like what, like, what are all the numbers that we need to talk about? Like, okay, so this is good. This is bad. Like in breaking all of that down, it was just such a, it was such a pain mm -hmm. and it's just such an easier tool now to just, like I said, give them the link, give them the stats. And I'm like, great, this is what we need to work on. Like <laughs> it really is like a great tool. <laughs> Thanks, you two. That really warms my heart. I always feel awkward. It's always a little awkward too, because it's like, oh, okay, but but thank you so much. No, that means that, that means a ton. And I think like continuing down this same trend of uh, translating this information um, in any type of ad account across all social platforms, it's a little bit of a black box. You jump in there, there's a ton of things. You don't need to know everything. There's just certain metrics that probably matter more to creative strategists and creators themselves. So as Abby asks here, what are the most important KPIs to look at when planning and how do they relate to the creatives? Uh, let's kick us off with Sarah, as I don't leave everyone in the dark. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a really good question because it has changed quite a lot. I think if you were doing any sort of media buying po like pre iOS 14, you had a very different set of metrics that you were looking at. Post iOS 14, it's all across the board. I, I've worked with a lot of media buyers now and everybody kind of has their own subgroup of things that they look at. I really like to look at just like three or four different metrics because it, uh, Facebook's reporting is so messed up right now that we can't really tell whether it's accurate. And that's the hardest part as a creative strategist is my job is to know how the, even how the reporting softwares work. So motion is a really good one to actually look at and see where the metrics are sitting. Obviously, if you're involved in like Triple Whale, North Beam, like Google Analytics, if you have all of these in place, you'll be able to make better decisions going forward. Um, the metrics that I specifically look at, CPA is probably the top one that I look at because I want to see, is it expensive or is it cheap <laughs> for us to get this customer in the door? If it's expensive, that tells me this is not hitting psychologically well, especially since as a media buyer nowadays, usually I, I lean towards broad. I'm just doing broad targeting not for all of my accounts, for, for quite a lot of them. So it just, I prefer to have something to, to start with. And CPA is probably the best one. From there, I'll move over to things like thumb stop, click through rate, anything that pertains to how the actual ad is being engaged with. Mm -hmm. I don't really love looking at CPMs anymore because mm. they're, I think they're inflated at this point. I don't know that Facebook's actually reporting them correctly. I also don't love to look at things like, and anything that pertains to how much it costs to get eyes on it, I'm not super worried about like the cost of eyes. I'm worried about the cost of conversions is what I'm worried about. So I, Lauren could add on to this, but those are usually the ones that I look at. No, that's literally, I mean, literally that's what I look at now. So I think like with all of those, it's, I mean, really, I, that's like the best reporting. I feel like that's out there right now. Um, because again, yeah. like Facebook is just so inflated and there's just so many things that I think is 
underreporting or just not reporting correctly. So it is really hard. I do, I, media buyers, like, I feel you, like, it's tough right now. <laughs> like, it's a tough job. <laughs> so I definitely like, it's, it's, it's hard. And so, you know, and clients sometimes have, a, they just don't understand everything that is going on within that ecosystem. And so, yeah, it's tough, but yeah, everything that Sarah does, I mean, that's literally my board. <laughs> I'm glad we're aligned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And coming in with like the, coming in, coming in with like the, um, the, I don't want to say controversial takes, but just like these things that it's on everyone's mind and how do we plug it out? But yeah. one of the big pieces that I want to also add to this is because like, I definitely lean more right brain heavy for everybody who's in the room. So like, um, I think a big thing when I start looking at metrics, it's where'd you spend your money and where'd you make your money? Like both Sarah and Lauren have yes. said. But when yeah. we're starting to break down different creatives, that's where there's different metrics. So this is going to lead into a question, I promise. But basically, <laughs> when we're talk, looking at different things like investing heavy, uh, a ton of money into our videos and running those assets, we know we can look at like thumbnail retention, thumb stop ratios, our hold rates, the drop off rates, where to place our CTAs and everything in between. So there's a really strong set of metrics. But how have you both found, and then maybe Sarah, you can cook us off of this, but how have you both found like those metrics really relate to like winning concepts? Are those strong leading indicators, would you say? Yeah, I, I, at this point, I have not seen anything that would say different, um, okay. specifically because you can compare the two. If we have a pretty good thumb stop rate and the CPA is low, that at least tells me that these are doing fairly well. If we have a really high click-through rate, but some reason all the conversions are just freakishly low, we got a problem, right? So I like to see, I have to compare, honestly. It's going to be required for you to be able to compare, which is, again, motion plug. <laughs> this is why motion is fantastic. Because I can, I can actually take those and compare them. Whereas in Facebook, it's actually really hard to set up custom reporting in Facebook. It drives me absolutely insane. It takes mm. hours for me to figure out, okay, which one do I want to report to? And how am I going to, like situate all this. So yes, I, if you can see the comparison between how different metrics compare to each other, then I can make an informed decision. Yeah, I agree. And again, that's, that's my motion plug as well, because it's so easy to do. And it's so easy to take those comparison numbers and actually like get the data that you need to get in such a clear format where you're like, okay, yep, this is working. Like this is, I know that this ad is actually winning in yeah. all the areas that I plugged in. So I definitely think that, yeah, it's, I, I don't like Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you know. I, anything Facebook. I'm just like, can we use something else? <laughs> it's a love hate relationship. It's a love hate yes. relationship. It's the same way I feel about technology. It's the same way I feel about technology and all honesty, right? Like it lets me down all the time, but I need you like come back. It's my life, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think this is also a great segue into like, just to paint the picture for everybody, we've talked about the initial research, the ideation, how do we start building those briefs and passing that information back and forth, of course. But where that also leads us is a question that's right at the top here. If we've now run it, we're in the ad account now. Once you've found a winning creative and it begins to fatigue, how slash what do you choose to change within it to scale it for longer? Uh, let's kick us off with Lauren. Um, again, I think it, it kind of depends on what exact, like, I think it depends on what exactly you're testing and how you are planning to scale. So again, like, I think this is such a, a broad question in that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it comes back to everything that we kind of talked about. And if you are talking about scaling this month, for instance, like when, like when our creatives start to fatigue, if we already know that, let's say it's the winning creative is this combo of text copy in the first three seconds and then this particular headline will run that and then literally just change the video and see like okay well that at least like the the concept is still the same but now we're just testing with like a new creative piece being like the visual as far as like what is what they're actually seeing and like will that be able to scale I mean if you still if you have that winning formula of all these things that are happening with within that and all you're changing is a video then it, potentially you could take that winning creative and scale it. And then just again, ask with new, with a new iteration as it starts to. Be. So, um, I mean, that's usually how I do it when we start to test creatives that are starting to fatigue is just really take that winning combination and just start adding in like new 
elements to the concept yeah. in order to test it. Awesome. And then Sarah, uh, anything to add on to that? Yeah, um, I, I think this to Lauren's point, like you have to know why it's fatigued, first of all. <laughs> I think that's probably pretty important. And from a media buying standpoint, sometimes it's difficult to tell because it might be working, working, working. And then all of a sudden one week just like down the drain for some reason. Um, but for the most part, if you already know what emotional sets you're hitting from your research, it's easier to tell, okay, like we're noticing the, actual, the frequency coming up in Facebook that it's just being shown too many times. So we'll test something else. It's also possible that it's not necessarily the creative that's not working. It could also just be the audience or the call to action mm. is fatiguing and will make the creative fatigue. So this is the tough part about being a creative strategist is again, I want to make it seem like we know all the things we don't, <laughs> we don't know all the things like, don't take this as a sign that your creative strategist is going to be able to tell you why everything's happening all the time. It's our job to have a read on all of it so that we can at least iterate and figure out where to go next. We are still human. We still have to take the data, interpret it and figure out where to go. Uh, and obviously this role is extremely helpful for doing that, but it's Facebook. This is paid advertising. Stuff is going to happen. Like ads yeah. are going to fatigue. They just are. But iteration comes from knowing why it was working and why it fatigued. Super important. This is so cool. I, I, I love like the creative strategist like world where it's just like we treat people as humans, like to get all soft and sentimental, right? Like it's yes. like at the end of the day, data tells a story and that story is related to people. So that's where it starts yes. to go. So yes. I'd actually like to transition this to, uh, to instead of keep going through like the different stages and we'll get to as many questions as we can before we hit our time. I think we're at the 15 minute mark here. But there's some general advice questions that people have been asking in our chat. And like a couple of things that have come through are related from the, the creative side or the creative brain more than anything. So I'm going to lump a couple of them together. If you need me to split them out, please just let me know. But the first one is like, how would you advise a creative person who to become more data oriented? And it's like, what advice would you give someone who's in a creative role, but wants to be a creative strategist? Those are a couple we've seen here. And then Lauren, if you can kick us off based on that experience, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, I think it's just getting into the ad account. Like the only way you're going to learn is to actually go inside of it, look at it, figure out like how everything works. I mean, again, like I don't like Facebook, but at the same time, like you need to understand how it works. And truthfully, one of the biggest things that I did was I sat with my media buyers. I sat with them. I learned like, okay, what exactly are you doing? Like how, how do these metrics track in a way that I can understand? And like, really like you need to sit down and you need to explain it because at the end of the day, like the only way you're going to learn is to actually sit down and do it. And so I used to actually go into ad accounts. I would turn ads off. I would build ads. Like I had like a really great team when, you know, I was working at an agency where the media buyers like actually sat down and were like, okay, great. Like this creative person, like actually wants to understand how this works. And the minute you understand how something works within Facebook, it's like, it clicks and you're just like, oh, like it's a whole new world of what I'm actually doing and how I can talk to my consumer. And really like for me, that was a changing point because once I understood where everything was going, like I was able to pivot and quickly be like, okay, let's do this. Let's do that. Because your brain just starts to think of like, oh, you're adding it into this audience. Like I know what's in this audience. I know who I'm talking to here. And then you start taking those creatives and just like putting them in. And then it's like win after win. And you know, like our team actually was like crushing it because like, I just understood what exactly I was doing, which made it such like, it just made it quicker. And it just made us easier to like, really talk to the people that we were talking to within the ad account. So I would say, honestly, just like sit down with your media buyer, grab a pen and paper and be like, teach me what you do, because I need to understand like <laughs> what is happening. <laughs> yeah. And then Sarah, on the inverse side of things, so based on your experience, like a media buyer who wants to lean heavier into that creative strategy side of things, what does that look like in advice that you would give? It's really interesting because for the creatives, there's all kinds of things that you can go and, and actually learn online without having to really do much. Like Dara Denny has one of the best YouTubes I've ever seen for learning media buying. Her stuff is like fantastic. She's just got a really good, good content over there. So like, if you want to learn media buying, go over to Dara Denny. Um, for the media buyers, it's really hard. I have not seen anybody. And maybe Lauren, you and I should do more of this, like how to learn creative <laughs> on our, <laughs> on our like channels. Cause both, both she and I have a YouTube channel, but like we haven't talked about it much before. 
Um, if you're a media buyer and you want to learn how to be more creative, again, you need to get paired with someone who's already doing it. It's mm -hmm. so much easier, I think, to learn things when you can see it and do hands-on practice. Um, if you're just like very new, starting out, like I'm just a media buyer, I haven't kind of, you know, dived, I haven't really done any research on how to get into this type of stuff. The easiest way to go is just to go into Canva because it's free. And Canva has a ton of like ad templates that you can use and just mess around with it. You don't even have to run them. I would take anybody that, any brand that you really, really like, Avi is usually the one that I kind of go to first just because they're extremely good brand. They have really good creative uh, and they're pink. It's just like fun. They have really fun ads. Usually I'll take Avi, pull it into Canva and see if I can duplicate their creative. Cause the only way you're gonna like, you know, flex that muscle is to actually flex it. Like you have to be designing things on a daily basis really to get good at it. And really just to study. We, we gotta be studying people who are doing a really good job with creative to be able to do what they do. Love it, love it. This is great. And I think like we're coming up on the, the 10 minute mark here. So everybody who's listening in, um, I will say if there is a question that you want to get in here, please keep uploading, keep, please keep uploading. So this is the way we're gonna tackle it. We've gone through like the structure of start to finish. Um, and I will, of course, closer to the end of this, like we're gonna plug Sarah and Lauren's information again into our chat, just so everyone, you can see what they're about, get to know them a little bit more, give them a follow, connect with them, all that kind of stuff. But to continue through these, uh, we'll see how many we can kind of bang through in a rapid fire way. <laughs> but from James, when and where would you use branded creatives? Oh, as my calendar goes off. When and where would you use branded creatives versus UGC style or TikTok style creatives? Sarah, can you kick us off? Yes, this is uh, an interesting one because everybody always wants to go branded. I don't necessarily think one is better than the other. I hear a lot of people say never ever go branded. Like you don't have to create pretty ads. Yes, um, but sometimes the pretty ads do way better than the TikTok ones do. Yep. So I like to see a healthy account is what I call it. I wanna see healthy account, meaning I want to see a broad range of creatives in there until we find one that hits well. Once you find one that hits extremely well, don't go crazy and put a ton of UGC into the ad account or a ton of like pro stuff into the ad account because they will fatigue. And then you'll have like 20 go offline in a day instead of just a set of five. So it, to answer this question, I would say try like stacks at the beginning a set of five UGC, a set of pro five pro ones with the emotional set that you found from the research and figure out which one people are hitting with most and stay on top of it. I actually like to have a backlog, all, like a, just a Google Drive folder with a ton of creative in it. That's like, crap, everything's fatiguing. Let's throw a whole bunch of new stuff in there that we know will work. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then Lauren, on your end. I would definitely just diversify your creatives. Like don't just have one particular thing. Like don't say branded only UGC TikTok only. Like again, Sarah's point, you have to have everything. You have to have branded, you have to have UGC, you have to have GIF carousel. Like you have to have everything. Like I always like to think of like evergreen trend, evergreen trend. Trends are going to fatigue much faster than evergreen. So like always make sure you have a healthy amount of evergreen. Always make sure you have a healthy amount of trend and branded. Like it's, everything needs to be diversified in your account. If you only have one thing in your account, things are going to fatigue so much faster and you're constantly going to have to be spinning your wheels and updating all the time. So diversify. <laughs> gotcha. And I think like, it's so, it's great that we have to, to layer these approaches. Cause I think like not one thing tells the entire story. There's always the holistic piece that tells the story. So I'm curious now just how you go about like even prioritizing where you place more of that effort. So Lauren, when you talk about both of the styles that we're looping in there, how are you saying like, okay, let's do more of the, the, the UGC style or TikTok as we call it verse like the stuff that looks great on the, not saying the other one doesn't look great but on the branded <laughs> side. So how are you prioritizing what that looks like? Is it split into weeks? Is it talk us through that? I, when I usually start off with an ad account, I actually like to give everything um, I like to do branded TikTok UGC. Um, I, I like to give a handful of everything because um, I think at, at that point you need to understand like what is going to resonate with people first. And then as I start to build off of what's going on, like, again, like it's going to be the, the research, it's going to be the data, like understanding the data is going to be the biggest part because again, like as things start to go into the account, you can start to test, you can start to iterate. But again, I always like to give Again, I always look at it as like evergreen trend, because I think that is like what is kind of happening right now. 
and like how things are, at least in the ad accounts I'm working on is that right. that's how we're starting to, to pivot on things because we need to have things that are constantly going to be running in the account, but then we also need to be testing a lot of things. And a lot of the trends right now are, you know, like those are going to fatigue faster. And so just making sure that we have a healthy amount of everything is, you know, is really what is really beneficial. Love it. Love it. Um, and then the next question that we have here is thrown is like really related to that media buying side. So Sarah, just based on that background, let's line it up here. And then Lauren, of course, if you have anything to add, jump in there. But what are the fixed mindsets that a media buyer should change if they look past optimization and targeting to include creative strategy? Oh, this one hits me right in the feels. Um, yes, <laughs> I feel you, media buyers. Um, I feel like a lot of media buyers that I work with and, and myself included, we have felt for a long, long time that we are holding up in the entirety of the brand uh, from a revenue standpoint. And we it's a very thankless job, unfortunately. The media buyers sometimes get blamed for things that are not necessarily our fault. Like if the consumers are literally just changing and they stopped buying for the month of October because they're prepping for Black Friday, we kind of get blamed for the fact that October was a bad month. <laughs> not our fault. It's a consumer thing. It happens every October is a bad month. So I think one of the mindsets that we need to be very careful about is assuming that it is our job to generate monthly. It's not your job to generate monthly. You're not supposed to be scaling every single month. I, I wish people would understand that this is not the basis of brand. If you're in it for the long haul, you shouldn't be scaling every month. You're not going to be scaling every month. You should be focused on what's happening this particular month in relation to the first three and the last three. Like it, we have to look at this more holistically. So make sure that when you're going into your job every single day, you're not putting that pressure on yourself of like, I have to scale. If I don't make the money, it's a bad month. You should be able to go to your brand and say, guys, this is the month that we just need to cut costs because we got to prep to push hard at Black Friday, right? It, it, it should be something <laughs> that you should be able to do. And I know for a lot of brands, this is not going to be feasible. Like media buyers, sometimes I think get a little shy about it because we're not sure whether that would be received well. So it, it just depends on the relationship you have with the brand but you're sitting in the seat. You are in the cockpit. You are the pilot of the entire thing. So if the brand comes like from behind out of the like passenger side and says, Hey, why aren't we going faster? You can say it's because I'm trying to hold on to money so that your black Friday is better. Right? So just give yourself a little bit of grace as a media buyer that the, this is a hard role and you have a very big amount of weight and responsibility on your shoulders and you are still a human and deserve respect overall. Preach. I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm like, let's normalize that comment because <laughs> it is hard. It's hard on media buying side and creative side. I mean, media buyers get blamed for that. Creatives get blamed for that. It's like, at the end of the day, it's like, it's not all on us, you know? And sometimes yeah. Yeah. I think the seasonality is something that is so yes. important and like making sure that you're clear up front to the brand. I mean, I've had these conversations just as a creative strategist with my brands. That's like, okay, it's summer. A lot of things are going to slow down or it's, yeah. you know, we got to start prepping for black Friday. Things are going to speed up. It's like, we have to be able to like normalize these conversations because if not, then like a lot of times like brand owners, I just don't think understand. And so I think is if you're having those conversations, that's going to be a huge thing that they're going to start to understand and be like, okay, I need to realize what's happening. And like you as the professional need to tell them this is what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think it comes down to as well, like creative strategists, it's our role to make sure that we know what's going on in the world. We just went through a pandemic and I had a lot of brands that were like, why aren't we selling anything? I'm like, we're in a pandemic. <laughs> like, <laughs> people are buying nothing but toilet paper right now. I don't know how yeah. to help you with this. <laughs> yeah. anyway. I think this hits everyone right in the gut, no matter what side you are around, right? Because like, I also come from the media buying space and for me, like, I tend to oversimplify things, but I always talk about storytelling at the end of the day. Everything we do is a story and how are we going to tell it? So when we're talking about those disconnects that occur, it's just like, okay, we know we, in our guts, based on the data, we know it's seasonality or we know our creatives working in the landing page isn't. Like, how are we going to tell that story? So we actually like persuade someone to believe that's the story. So yeah. that's where I think yeah. like the creative strategy muscle too, that both Saren and Lauren have talked today in depth, like really helps with that. Right. So when we talk about those questions of like, what type of um, like advice would you give a media buyer? It's like really focus on storytelling in your home base first. So when you look at that data, what story does it tell? I see a high CTR, but I see a low conversion rate. My creative is working, but the landing page isn't as much. How do I articulate mm -hmm. now to everyone involved? 
That's me yeah. standing on my soapbox, everybody. But um, but I think. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. <laughs> yeah, it's true though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So like building that muscle of storytelling, I think will naturally start leading into like all of the intricacies that both Sarah and Lauren like like really live and breathe at the end of the day. Um, but looking at this with a minute left, I, I, I feel like we've gotten to a really good place and we painted the high level picture that we wanted to, right? We got everyone where they wanted to be. So the last couple of things I like, I don't know if everyone watches it, but just like hot ones or hot wings and everyone has their last little thing that they end with. <laughs> so I just kind of want to give the floor to Sarah and Lauren. I've been talking a ton. So uh, I was wondering, Sarah, just talk your stuff. Uh, everyone can, where can I meet you? What do you want them to know? Talk to them. Yes. Thank you, Evan. You have been fantastic. You are like one of the best moderators I think I've ever seen in my life. Yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you want to follow me, I am on Twitter all day, every day, uh, even the days that probably shouldn't be, I'm on Twitter. So you can follow me at Sarah Levenger, uh, last name L-E-V-I-N-G-E-R. And I'm over there basically just talking a whole bunch about consumer psychology. So if you want to learn more about that, that's the primary space that I'm in. I'm also on YouTube at Sarah Levenger. And then on LinkedIn at Sarah Levenger. And then I also have a podcast, uh, Pit Stop Podcast, which is tactical stuff. So it's just 15 minute bite sized episodes where I'm talking to all kinds of operators. I So far, I haven't had a whole lot of like big names yet. And I can't decide whether I want to get some big names. I don't know. Evan, you're a big name. Do you want to come on my podcast? Not a big um, name. Anyway. No, that's not <laughs> I love the operators though. This is the, the big part about that podcast is like, I want to give people actionable things to take home and be able to use for their brand. So that's where you can find me. Uh, website is hdperformancecreative.com. Otherwise, Lauren, where can people find you? Yeah. So I, my company is the loft 325. So anything at loft 325, the loft 325, I'm on Twitter all the time. Um, I am always commenting and talking to Sarah, <laughs> we're going back and forth in our tweets. Um, and again, really, I'm more just talking about the creative side of things and taking that creative strategy and just really implementing into your creative. So if you have any questions about creatives, what platforms I use, how I'm using them, like I would love to talk to you. I love talking about creative. Um, I do have a YouTube channel as well. Again, talking about all things creative, um, really just helping people understand their ad accounts for creative. Um, so yeah, the law three, two, five, that's me. <laughs> Amazing. You have both been absolutely incredible. And as you can see, like, there's still so many questions we didn't get through. And oh. of course, like we want to try and get to them after, but if anything, we can run another session, whatever it might be, but thank you both so much. Like, I, I hope this is helpful for all the thank attendees. You. Um, any other questions, like, like I said before, all of this is going to be shared. So it's all accessible. Um, but Sarah, Lauren, bottom of my heart, really appreciate you. Like I said, really respect thank you both you. as well. Yeah, and everyone, <laughs> and everyone who has attended, I hope this was helpful. Um, and I, I hope to see you at, at more things, more of Sarah's podcast, just checking out more of Lauren's YouTube channel, everything. Um, thank you, everybody. Really, really appreciate it. And we'll chat soon. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See ya. <laughs>